the presentation, which uh, is being broadcast thanks to the assistance of the Geneva Environmental Network. Uh, very much appreciated. This is a site event entitled Tackling the Hidden Basel Plastic Waste. And my name is Jim Puckett. I'm the executive director of the Basel Action Network. We're going to be hearing today from IPIN also, a report they've uh, recently written, as well as Changing Markets, another report uh, called Trashion, which is about plastic fashion. Um, first, I'm going to have us look at the agenda for today. And um, we're going to be first turning it over to Lee Bell of IPEN who will talk about this report about the hidden numbers on plastic waste trade. I'll turn it back over to me and I'm going to talk about a different sort of hidden numbers, the hidden uh, plastics in the Basel Convention, which are not being controlled, which we are stating should be controlled. And then we're going to look at three examples of those hidden forgotten plastics. We're going to be looking at plastic waste in paper bales, uh, plastic in refuse derived fuel, and plastic textile waste. And then we're going to talk about recommendations and hear from you all what you think might be recommendations as well and get some questions and discussion going. So, Lee, I'm going to turn it over to you. You're going to get this through um, your report. Great. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, as Jim mentioned, my name is Lee Bell. I'm the IPEN Mercury and POPs Policy Advisor. And I also spend a bit of time in uh, the plastics arena as well, more recently, including the crossover between pops and plastics. But today, I'd like to talk to you about uh, a report that we released very recently uh, called The Plastic Waste Trade and the Hidden Numbers. Uh, I was not one of the authors, but uh, the authors were uh, Dr. Therese Carlson, Jan Dell, Sudat Rubyu, and Bethany Carney uh, Almroth. Uh, and uh, we were looking at uh, the issues that arose out of uh, a lot of the work we were doing uh, with projects with our member groups uh, on HS codes, which I'll explain in a moment, and tracking the plastic waste trade. Uh, and the tariff codes uh, that we're talking about are the ones that uh, can be looked at uh, online under the UN Contrave database. And it's a global tracking system looking at the trade in products. And what we what we found as a result of looking at this database was that there are plastic codes that are more directly related to plastic waste and others that are indirect that actually conceal uh, a, a quite a significant plastic waste trade. So we're talking about revealing the hidden underreported volumes of plastic waste. So the most common HS code, and when I say a HS code, on the UN Comtrade database, these are the harmonized commodity description and coding systems known as HS. HS3915 is waste pairings and scrap of plastics. And most people attribute the plastic waste trade under this heading uh, in terms of trade and the, uh, the information that uh, customs officers um, record and then send to the, set, the central database. Uh, so uh, we, we derive those codes from the, the Comtrade database and it's used basically to track the plastic waste trade. The HS codes were not made to track all plastic and HS 3915 only covers a small part of the trade, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Plastics are found in many other types of waste, not just plastic waste directly, and that includes textiles, paper bales, electronics, and refuse-derived fuel, which Jim mentioned earlier. So uh, when you look at some of the other codes that are out there, uh, code 6, HS 6309 is worn clothing and accessories. And there is also a separate code known as HS5505. And you can see on the chart behind me uh, that HS5505, which is uh, actually waste of synthetic fibres, is a relatively small contribution compared to the other groups. Uh, but when you actually look at the textiles themselves, uh, we're really talking about 60 to 70 cent of percent of textiles being synthetic plastic material. Uh, so it's quite a large proportion of all worn clothing and synthetic fibres. And the real problem arises when you export this material overseas and there is uh, uh, literature, literature citations and studies showing that 
of that worn clothing is effectively deemed worthless upon arrival in the country that imports it and is effectively dumped. So it becomes dumped plastic waste, uh, at least in a significant measure. So when we're talking about 60 to 70 percent, uh, that translates in this chart, uh, which was a, a 2021 trade data, to either a, a, low, a low estimate of 24 uh, percent assumed as tra uh, a plastic waste and a high of 28 percent. Uh, based on those figures. So you can see that there's probably around about half a million tonnes uh, of this waste being exported that's not being picked up in the HS3915 code. So the secondary uh, uh, hidden data that we found was in relation to paper bales. Paper bales exported uh, of scrap paper intended for recycling in paper mills and those sorts of things. So when we looked at, uh, at these particular paper bales, which are on HS4707900000, uh, which is waste scrap, including unsorted paper and paperboard, uh, we found that the plastic contamination rates within those bales was something like 5 to 30% of the bales, which is an enormous amount of material. And so in terms of uh, the methodology, we simply multiplied uh, the Comtrade data for that particular HS code. I won't repeat it because it's too long, but we multiplied it by 0.05 and 0.3 respectively and came up with an estimate of uh, 0.2 to 1.3 million tonnes of additional plastic being exported that is not counted in the plastic waste uh, export data under 3915. So you can see that there's effectively uh, uh, more than uh, probably 1.5 million tonnes, uh, up to 2 million tonnes, of plastic waste moving around undetected in the regular UN Comtrade system. And if we look at plastics in textiles and paper ba bales and include uh, that material, we're really looking at around 1.6 to 2.4 times higher amounts of plastic being moved than we see in the HS3915 code. And this still does not account for all plastics. There's still more out there. But an interesting effect of calculating this data is we uh, change the profile of who are the major exporters. If we're simply looking at the uh, plastic pairings HS code 3915, Japan appears to be one of the highest exporters of plastic waste. But by the time we add in the paper bales and the textile exports, we start to see that the EU and the US are becoming major exporters of this material overseas, with the United Kingdom not far behind. Uh, and in terms of uh, the refuse derived fuel, which is a mixture of plastic, say up to 30% in the bales, uh, it's plastic materials, it includes textiles, paper scrap and a whole range of other materials. These are being exported, uh, particularly from uh, developed countries to developing countries to be burned in cement kilns as a so-called alternative source of energy supply for those cement kilns. And uh, other speakers here will be talking about that. Uh, at the last BRS COP, we presented a range of presentations on, on this matter uh, about the growing and expanding uh, RDF trade around the world and the shipping of these materials uh, from developed countries. And just a quick point I'd like to make is about in these plastic wastes that are travelling overseas are many hazardous chemicals. And in a report released just a day or two ago here on the global governance of plastics and associated chemicals, uh, it was quite revealing to see exactly how much of these chemicals, and many of them hazardous, are actually controlled and regulated through various international conferences. And you can see the, uh, the, the pie chart with the large yellow section is a combination of the Montreal, Minamata and Stockholm Convention uh, regulations. And then when you transfer that to all the chemicals used in plastics, uh, that are of potential concern or known hazardous uh, materials and, and including also low concern chemicals. You can see that very fine sliver of black on the large pie chart is effectively the, the hazardous chemicals that are regulated in plastic waste worldwide. So a very, very small fraction of all chemicals are regulated. That means most plastic waste traveling overseas carries as a vector these hazardous chemicals to many countries that are not in a position to manage the waste and it either gets burned or dumped in the environment, leading to food chain contamination and human exposure. Uh, if you want to read more about what this plastic waste is doing when it's burned and dumped in other countries, IPEN has a series of reports available on its website 
uh, including this recently released one on the chlorine plus in e-waste plastics dumped in uh, in Thailand. Uh, and uh, of course, that's just been regulated uh, by agreement under this convention. Uh, and I'll return to the agenda and let Jim take it from here. Sure. Thanks, Lee. Next, I'm going to talk about a similar scenario that's happening here at the Basel Convention. Um, and reiterating the main points that you just heard from Lee, almost all the cited statistics that are recording the waste trade of plastics, they're almost all exclusively using 3915 which we've just learned is maybe half of the global problem of the trade. 3915 does not include the many plastics of so rubber waste, textile waste, paper waste, RDF, etc. When these other hidden and forgotten plastic wastes are counted, statistically recorded exports are probably more than double. So we have a very similar situation here at Basel back in 2019. Many of you attended that amazing COP, COP 14, where we got what used to be called the Norwegian Amendment, now it's called the Plastic Waste Amendments, where for the very first time, really, the Basel Convention said, okay, we're going to control plastic waste, whether it's hazardous or not. Um, and they made three different uh, categories, which we'll talk about. But at that time, we were all celebrating. And at that time, we didn't realize, wow, we didn't really nearly cover it all. And we're still having implementation problems with what we are covering. But today we're going to talk about what we're not covering, what we should be covering. So the plastic waste forgotten by Basel are similar. We are seeming to be covering the 3915 HS code. Um, and a lot of that is um, Y48 and um, A3210 as they translate to the Basel codes. But uh, many of these plastic waste should actually qualify as Y48, A3210, which are not listed on those listings, but are listing on, on the non-hazardous codes of Annex 9. So these are things that we're going to talk about what they really are that we're not controlling at all. Very similarly, maybe we're controlling half of what we should be. And these are what we're calling the hidden and forgotten fossil plastic waste. So today we argue strongly that Basel needs to rectify this oversight and ensure the control procedures of A3210, which is hazardous plastics, and Y48 plastics for special consideration are also controlled. So these hidden plastics um, are inappropriately missing in the, in the basic uh, three categories for the following reasons. They're not being listed anywhere in the Basel annexes, and that applies to RDF. Right now, there's no category. You can say it's waste for, collected from households, Y46. That's probably the closest it gets to any, anybody ever considering it in a, in a controlled category. And uh, we would like to see it controlled. It's a huge problem, and it is a waste. Some people try to call it RDF a commodity, but we consider it clearly a waste. Um, so some of them are being considered by some as a non-waste even. Some people call it a commodity, so then they would be outside the convention's purview entirely. And then we have another category of things that are separately listed, but they're listed as a non-hazardous waste, and there's no reason they should be. Uh, so the basis of the harm caused, it's all the same. The scientific basis for listing them originally remains the same for these hidden plastics, so there's no real good reason that we're doing this. In fact, if you look at the original decision coming out of COP14, it's all about preventing and minimizing the generation of plastic waste, uh, all of it, presumably, promote the environmentally sound and efficient management of plastic waste by improving the collection, transport, et cetera, reducing the transboundary movement. Now, we never defined plastic waste, but the assumption by everyone in the room was, yeah, it's plastic and it's waste. We're going to cover it. Uh, but that didn't happen. Actually, when you look at how it's playing out and how countries are implementing the new amendments, they are not looking at these codes that are buried in the non-hazardous list. They're ignoring them. So non-hazardous plastic waste, uncontrolled, A3210 is the hazardous plastic waste, are controlled as hazardous waste. It's a very small sliver at the moment. So we haven't really dug into the additives that would qualify them as hazardous. And then the big development at COP14 was Y48. This is special consideration. You don't have to prove it's hazardous, but it's, ha it's mixed polymers, 
contaminated polymers, contaminated with anything, even other polymers. Um, it, it's halogenated plastics like PVC, and uh, they can't be going to non, uh, they can't be going to any destination that's not R3 under Annex 4, so that means they can't go to landfills and waste to energy incineration. All of that now should be controlled as a minimum with prior informed consent. Uh, the basic control procedure of the Basel Convention. So that was the intention. But the intention was to cover all lots of ways. You ask anybody, yeah, that's what we're doing. So it didn't happen. The characteristics of these are that they will be controlled. A321 absolutely is affected by the party to non-party trade ban. So like the United States should not be trading on this with anybody because they're a non-party. Uh, it should be subject to the Basel Ban Amendment prohibition on trade between developed countries and developing countries. And then all the other ones should be at least prior informed consent. And with Y48, it's similar. It's affected by the party to non-party trade ban. The US shouldn't be trading in Y48 with parties. Uh, prior informed consent between Basel parties. And then in the EU, they've included uh, Y48 or Annex 2 listed wastes in their ban to non-OECD countries. So in the EU, it's actually a ban to send these mixed and contaminated plastics to developing countries but as we will see there's a big fight so um so what plastics are falling through the cracks what are these hidden forgotten plastics and are they meant to remain uncontrolled and we would argue absolutely not so if you look at there's a table eight on the draft technical guideline which is being hammered out downstairs as we speak they have a table in there where they say these are kind of entries that are sort of related to plastic. And I ask, I kind of wonder why this table exists, but I'm glad it does because they don't tell you what to do with this stuff. They don't say, well, you should be controlling it. Uh, but we can look in here, we can see waste metal cables insulated with plastics. We can see pre treatment of composite packaging, which includes plastics. Uh, we've got all kinds of things in here uh, glues, adhesives that are associated with plastics. Um, electronic waste, of course, textile waste, and single-use cameras, things like that. So everything in yellow here is what we're concerned about as being hidden and forgotten, because these are not to apply to the control procedures. These are non-hazardous listings. And then missing from Table 8, for various reasons, is some other really important things, like refuse-derived fuel, which is not at all listed under Basel. And plastic mixed into paper waste, for some reason, it's not on that table in table eight. They say, if that's just paper, don't worry about it. And then there's rubber waste. And almost all of rubber, so-called rubber, is plastic. There's probably a tiny percentage that's actually natural rubber. Um, so why aren't we covering rubber the same way? It's a massive issue. So many tires are being exported and dumped and burned, et cetera. Um, and then waste pairings and scrap of rubber, and then there's tires. So these are also hidden and forgotten in terms of the control procedures of the Basel Convention. Uh, the concern is that countries are just interpreting this as, okay, we don't have to do that. We don't have to even think about it. And my biggest concern is the big block of countries, the EU, 27 countries, uh, have in their guidance uh, that they have for the EU correspondence group on the waste shipment regulation, which is their application of the Basel Convention. If you read this, they say a waste that among other materials contains plastic, but can be classified under a specific other entry. You don't have to do anything about it. It cannot be classified under one of the entries on plastic waste, but is to be classified under the relevant specific entry that exists. So they're basically telling people, don't worry about it. If there's plastic, 30% of it in paper bales, don't worry about it. If that plastic gets dumped in Asia and it gets burned in Asia in a tofu factory or whatever, don't worry about it. And that's what the EU's advice has been to date. We want to see that change. So a summary of the problems we've identified, it's likely half of the global plastic waste problem is not being controlled despite the landmark Basel decision in 2019. Plastic waste guidelines currently provide no guidance on how to use Table 8 listings or the other forgotten plastic waste with respect to transboundary movement controls. Some countries, the EU, have already decided they're not going to control these that should logically be controlled either by Y48 or A3210. And so we have no evidence that these 
classics have been controlled today by any party. I have yet to find a case where this is happening. It may be in some very responsible country is doing that, but I have not heard about it. Um, and as a result, we have an egregious free trade and dumping of mixed and contaminated plastic waste currently happening today. And um, we're going to look at three examples. The first one coming to us all the way from Hong Kong. We have Oan Ha on the phone, and she's going to show us a video and take questions. It's very late at night for her over there. So we're going to take her questions right after her presentation. The rest of the questions will wait till the end of this presentation entirely. So on Ha, I would like to hand the floor over to you and you tell me when to press the button to uh, run the video. But you want to say a few words first? Uh, you're muted, Oan. Yes, how about now? That, that, that works better. Hi there. Uh, good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm here in Hong Kong where it is, I guess, early morning, though it's very, very dark here. A little bit after midnight, my time here. Um, really, really uh, thank you so much, Jim, uh, for the invitation to join you guys. Um, I'm Wan Ha. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News here in Hong Kong. And uh, last year in 2022, colleagues and I uh, in you know the US, the UK, and in Thailand, um, we we all embarked on various stories that made up a series uh, called the Big Plastic Series um, that Bloomberg, uh, you know, gave us a green light to work on, and it involved months and months of reporting on four different continents. Um, you know, my colleague Kit Chalel, who was really the mastermind of the series, um, you know, he he did a story out of out of London, basically looking at where um, you know, Tesco's promises of recycling. You know where that ended up by looking at factors to be placed inside um, Tesco plastic packaging. Um, you know, I uh, this video I, I will show you will actually takes a, takes a look at that plastic that is hidden in paper bales that that travels you know thousands of miles from the U.S. to a small town um, in in India outside of New Delhi and what happens there and, and the devastation that that's causing. Um, colleagues in uh, Kit also did, did a story looking at Ghana's broken recycling system, while another colleague, Matt Campbell in uh, Thailand, looked at looked at plastic waste and, of course, the problems of plastic waste from developing to to from from uh, developed to non-developing countries such as Thailand. Um, and then we also had a colleague, Leslie Kaufman, uh, on the East Coast in the U.S., who also took a very you know interesting look at TerraCycle and the promises, as well as kind of the the, you know ambiguities and the grades of, of where of where that kind of cycle um, and, and the problem there um with that you know i wanted i wanted to specifically i mean it, i think it was actually after chat with 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 uh with jim and with jan dell who i've made on this call you know talking about the various problems of plastic that that we really talked about somebody had mentioned the problems of, of, of plastic and paper bales which is probably Jim, in fact um and, and that really intrigued me the fact that there is this hidden loophole in which plastic was being imported um to developing countries um and so so i honed in on on this town in india uh out, about three hours outside of new delhi and it was pretty stark what we found there uh and you know certainly as a as an american and as a as a consumer of of all of these brands um it, it was a pretty a big shock to my own system um even though i i kind of had a sense of, of what was going on there anyways we we obviously did you know we did a very um, uh, rich uh, multi-platform story that obviously included a, a you know very long text story with lots of great images. We had a, a, a film crew there, video crew there with us who uh, who you know took photo took photographs as well as videos, um, and we incorporated that into the story as well as drone shots as well. Um, and and in the end, I I also in uh, to accompany the text story. Um, with the photographs and, and great video gifts that we had. Um, I also did a video uh, as well. And so I'm going to show you that. Unfortunately, it's about seven minutes. Um, so hopefully that won't tax your patience too much. And then I'll stay on the line for any questions you might have. And then that after that, I get, unfortunately I have to do because I've got an early morning here. So Jim, ready for you okay, to press Okay, uh, we'll try to run this video here. Thanks. और तो उससे फिर खांसी उठाया और फिर तबीयत सी खराब होती चल जाएगा 
This is a story about recycling gone awry and how claims of sustainability from large companies are going up in flames. Mustafar Nagar is a city 80 miles north of New Delhi. The surrounding area is known for its sugar and paper mills. Now it's taken on a much darker claim to fame as a dumping ground for ton after ton of American plastic. This field of plastic is right behind a village. There are children playing nearby. We've walked through it, and surprisingly, most of this plastic comes from overseas, mostly from the US and Canada. And one brand stands out, Amazon. Literally, there are Amazon shipping bags all over this field. How did this plastic waste from overseas get here? Paper mills rely on imported waste paper because it's cheaper than wood pulp. And India can't source enough paper for recycling domestically. The problem is that plastic packaging waste is often bundled with this waste paper. It's estimated that as much as 500,000 tons of plastic waste is coming into India every year. Much of that plastic ends up being used as fuel by local industries, including paper and sugar mills. Residents say they know when plastic was burned overnight because they usually wake up to a layer of gray and black ash that coats terraces, crops, and anything left outdoors. Vimla Devi is a longtime resident who's developed health problems in the last few years because of pollution from burning plastic. We're surrounded by paper mills here in the city of Musafarnagar. Plumes of thick black smoke are billowing from these facilities all around us. We don't know for sure what they're burning, but experts say black smoke is one indication that plastic's being burnt. Rahul Kumar is an activist in a village in Musafir Nagar. He leads a group of eight volunteers working to raise awareness of air and water pollution caused by the industrial burning of plastic. Recycling is supposed to cut pollution and give valuable materials a second life, but here the global recycling system's failings are hard to deny. Labels reveal just how far the waste has traveled. There's plastic trash from Nestle, Costco's Kirkland and Under Armour, all thrown out by U.S. and Canadian consumers some 7,000 miles away. Still, some paper industry executives in Musafarnagar say the plastic that comes with paper recycling isn't a problem. Pankaj Agarwal runs a paper mill and is chairman of the Paper Manufacturers Association for the state of Uttar Pradesh. This is imported. Oh, this is imported? Yeah, maybe Canada or maybe from US. This is mixed waste. Uh -huh. But there is no much contamination. You can see there is not much plastic. At a dump site close to Agarwal's paper mill, one plastic envelope with the United States Postal Service label stood out. It had a name and address printed directly on it. It had been shipped to Lori Smila who we later found out was a 73-year-old retiree from Slotesburg in Rockland County, New York. We tracked her down from India. Lori, it's Juan Ha from Bloomberg News. Thanks so much for joining us from upstate New York. So I found something that used to belong to you. This is a United States Postal Service <laughs> envelope that arrived in your house once. And we found it in this field. What do you make of it? It's phenomenal because uh, I, I know that I do receive packages on a regular basis. I'm sure that one contains something I ordered. 
uh, the question is, how in the world did it end up um, in India? Well, you know, as consumers, we think that when we put something into the recycling bin, I mean, what's the expectation there? And I'm wondering how you feel about that. For years, we've thought that everything that we're doing is the right thing. But um, obviously, that wasn't the case. I feel sorry for anyone who lives uh, within a five-mile radius of the site you're standing on. Amazon wouldn't comment on the presence of its packaging in Musafar Nagar. But in a statement, the company said it was committed to minimizing waste and helping customers recycle their packaging. The Uttar Pradesh Pollution Control Board that oversees Musafar Nagar said it fined nearly half of the more than 30 mills in the city for burning plastic and not managing the ash from their milling process just in October. Still, the problem isn't going away. The grandmother worries what the pollution from overseas will do to the next generation. Alrighty, so that's uh, that's the the video element of uh, of the story that uh, that I wrote. I spent about a week in uh, the city of Musafirnagar to really kind of understand the full issues, and it was pretty startling. Um, and I also, actually, I wanted to also thank Lee because I actually had spoken to Lee uh, at some point in in the reporting of this as well. So thank you. A lot of a lot of you guys are are part of this story in some way. So thank you so much for your help and for your support and contributions. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have before I pop off. Yeah, we've got some from online participants. We'll start with those. Um, First one says, what does the Indian authority say about this? Would you say corruption at every level is the reason for this? Do you think the Western industrialized nations are selling the failed solution to low cost countries such as recycling? Yeah, so um, in terms of in terms of the reaction, I mean, obviously there was a lot of shock, you know, shocked reactions. There was actually a lot of uh, a lot of Indian Indian media that followed up on this story. Um, and, you know, also went to Ms. Renegar, kind of duplicated the reporting that we did um, in, in the weeks and months after um, the, the Uttar Pradesh uh, Pollution Control Board uh, was ordered by the Central Control Board to actually look into the issue. But as far as, you know, why we can tell on from, you know, or from what's happening on the ground, it doesn't look like much is happening. And if anything, it continues, it continues to be a problem. Um, I think, I think the, the question in, ter in terms of, so, so, you know, there is, Obviously, you know, lots of lots of chatter, but in actual in actuality, you know, what's actually happening on the ground, I, I think is is there's a lot more that could be happening on the ground. Um, we did speak to, um, you know, a politician who was, you know, very um, who actually who has been trying on his own uh, in many ways to to stop this this problem as well. I mean, he, you know, right before we'd gotten there, he actually had gone to you know, paper mills, staked them out in the middle of the night, saw that they were burning, went there, you know, with, with the, with the, uh, with, with the law enforcement officials and actually stopped, you know, actually stopped the work that was doing there and, 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 you know, put them, gave them fines and, and all this stuff. But, but even he said it was a helpless situation because he says at the end of the day, the fines are nothing compared to the money that they can save by burning plastic. And so it continues to be a problem. Um, while we were there, uh, word got out that we were there and, uh, then all of a sudden things seemed to be, you know, harder to discover. I mean, you know, the first few days that we were there, we, we saw actually plastic coming in and out of paper mills and then toward the end of the week when word had gotten out that they were there. I mean, even, even the police 
uh, who we encountered along the way said, oh, we know we had heard that you guys were here. Um, so, you know, they, they tried to, to kind of stop the activity um, toward the later end while we were there. Um, so, I mean, it's 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 that kind of, you know, uh, cat and mouse kind of chase where where, you know, once officials, if officials get enough complaints, if, if there's enough attention paid to it, they're a little work to try to tamp it down. But then, of course, it it. it it, it then continues right up. So I think it's unless unless there is major cyclical disruption, um, and and you know, government agencies um, that are willing to really crack down and and and, you know, certainly from the west from the west and the developed countryside, unless there are there are, you know, pressure for these for these um, you know corporations and, and industries to stop actually stop and disrupt um you know what's happening in terms in terms of the plastic that's hidden paper bales um i don't think you're going to see much much improvement is is kind of the, the sense that that i'm walking away with unfortunately um and your question about corruption i mean yes i mean we've certainly talked to plenty of people who who said that corruption is, is a big part of it obviously somebody is making money or i should say a lot of people are making money along the way I mean, you know, this this plastic waste that comes in paper bales, it's it's nearly worthless, some of it, but some of it is, you know, it was amazing, even in the piles that we saw, which had been scavenged through some of it already, you could still see that there were, um, you know, for example, crushed um, soda cans, uh, you know, there was aluminum, aluminum cans, so there, there was, there was, you know, certain kinds of, of recycling that somehow made it through the municipal system of the US that was still valuable. And so, so that stuff would, you know, all the metal stuff would would get stripped out by, would get, you know, discovered or sifted through by by these, you know, women who were who were sifting through all of this without any protective gear or very minimal, really protective gear, for maybe as much as, you know, three dollars a day if if they were lucky, um, you know. So, so the valuable plastics was was being was being taken away, but then then in the end, you had all of this plastic packaging that was worthless, and so, but to somebody, it was worth something. Uh, what often would happen is that the paper mills would sell it to uh, a plastic recycler who would then offload it to, you know, who would sell it then to a uh, sugar mill. So we saw that when the plastic was being burnt, it was actually in sugar mills. And we also know for a fact, just from a reporting, that it was, it was also being burnt at, at paper mills as fuel as well, because plastic is cheaper and burns it at higher rates. Um, than wood, and it's you know it's cheaper than wood or or or, or bagasse, which um, which is the the pulp from leftover from sugar cane that that's used by the by the sugar cane industry that that's you know one of the established industries there. They also prefer uh, plastic as well. I'm going to see if we got any more questions for you from the room here. Yep. Uh, anybody uh, have a question for her before we let her go? On what she discovered and her video. Okay, want to say any final words? We're going to um, move on to our next example of the hidden forgotten plastics. Yeah. Uh, but thank you. So, oh, yeah, we have one question. Yeah. Uh, the question would be, uh, did uh, they contacted Amazon, for instance, to ask about how they are? <laughs> the yeah, Amazon. in her film, she said uh, what, what Amazon said to you was very simple, right? Yeah, I mean, Amazon and, and all of these, I mean, all of these corporations, uh, basically, you know, their, their, their stance is that, you know, we do our part to help consumers recycle, right? To, to, to Amazon's view, all of that plastic is recyclable if consumers just drop it off at the proper place. Um, and of course, we know that that, that even if they do, that necessarily doesn't mean that it will get recycled. Um, so, so I think there there is a lot of, of passing buck, buck in terms of responsibility and accountability, certainly by corporations that, that are churning out this plastic and by the plastic industry itself. All right. Well, listen, we're going to let you go. Have a good night. Sleep. And, yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Tune in later and see the rest of the show and <laughs> what you missed. But we appreciate it so much, Anha. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Hi. Next, uh, we're going to bring in uh, from London, Yuyun Ismawati, who's a IPEN member and works uh, in her own organization, Nexus 3 Foundation. Uh, and she's going to talk to you about refuse derived fuel. The, this is one that's really a gaping loophole because it doesn't even have an entry, let alone any kind of designation in the Basel Convention. So, Yuyun, go for it here. 
Thank you for the intro, uh, James, and thank you for having me in this webinar. Uh, apologies, I cannot be there in person, but uh, I'd like to share some of uh, our works, and this is also covered in the um, on the IPEN website, and the report has been released last year. Um, I will I will share some cases uh, from five countries. And uh, please apologize if I jump around from one country to another country as an ex example. Um, okay, let me see if I can do this. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is just an introduction. I can skip this uh, this part. Uh, I would like to acknowledge um, this uh, presentation materials and the slides are provided by um, many colleagues, um, mainly under the IPEN participating organizations, Basel, Net, Basel Action Network, Arnica Association, the Swedish government as a funder uh, through IPEN, and then consumers associations in Penang, ECOWAS coalitions, Earth and National Toxics Network, Australia, ECOTON Indonesia, Alliance for Zero Waste Indonesia, and Dr. Roland Weber. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Uh, how can I? Okay, so I can go by myself. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. You go, you go ahead and control it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, these are the, the uh, life cycle of, of plastics, as you <clears throat> know, uh, from upstream to, to downstream. So when we talk about the downstream, we have to bear in mind that during the production process, a lot of chemicals has been used, as uh, presented also in the slide uh, shared by um, Jim earlier. Um, so RDF uh, consisted of various uh, materials, uh, they call it refuse derived fuel, process engineered fuel, solid waste fuel, waste derived or solid recovered, and even tire. And the sources of RDF came from uh, mainly uh, municipal waste, commercial construction, demolitions, and vehicle tires. Um, and these are the type of uh, uh, RDF, if you browse and Googling, it will look like this. And from uh, developed countries, it will be exported to developing countries or to OECD countries in bales, and uh, like this one on the left. Um, but sometimes if they shipped it to developed con developing countries, it will be a bit barren, not covered by uh, plastic bales. And um, on the ground, um, RDF is um, uh, presented in different form uh, in terms of briquettes or pellets, different sizes and different uh, materials. It could be biomass from agriculture waste. Uh, it could be um, a mix of uh, organic waste uh, combined with a little bit of plastics. But uh, there are there are also um, RDF containing mainly plastics packaging like this one. They call it, it's not in form of pellets or briquettes, but they call it fluff. You know, I hate the words fluff. It's supposed to be cute, but this one, they call it fluff and they use it to feed the cement uh, kiln. Um, so RDF and R SRF are um, also in, um, the transboundary trade of them already uh, in place since um, 1990s. And um, the trade within uh, Asia also has been practiced um, many years. Um, sorry. Um, so the HS codes that we tried to monitor um, during the study last year, is that um, highlighting the HS code 3915 um, and to be specific, it's 9090. Um, and then 3825, that mainly coming from um, municipal waste. And then um, refuse derived fuel in some countries recognized uh, through 3825, uh, 10. But in other country, um, it's under 3606, uh, 99010. So, it's not easy for us to monitor this because every country have different interpretation and classifications of RDF. Um, so in uh, in general, uh, there are seven types of RDF, but the the main RDF that use um, um, utilizing the domestic waste are RDF type five, um, and we try to collect some samples to understand um, the different calorific value uh, from every, um, from the available uh, RDF in Indonesia. 
And um, <coughs> number two in the chat below here uh, from Jeruk Lagi Chilachap is the fluff one. And they are consisted of, um, it's a dry uh, crisp of uh, our flexible packaging. And because it's dry, the calorific value is higher than uh, compared to other RDF. Um, and um, due to the recommendations from the Corruption Committee and then the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Energy Mineral Resources, um, the utilizations of waste in Indonesia not prioritized for uh, to, to produce energy, uh, to produce electricity, but uh, waste to energy is the recommended, um, the strong recommended uh, form. And to support that, many standards, national standards has been issued. However, these standards is, is not functioning <laughs> because it's not, it cannot be up, applied because this is all voluntary. And there is no enforcement that any product or producer of uh, RDF should apply or follow uh, any of the standards. So it's still um, so um, the use of RDF in Indonesia also has been promoted as the co-processing, like in other countries, uh, co-processing and co-firing. Co-processing is the term used for cement kiln, um, and co-firing is the term used for coal fire power plant. Uh, like in other countries also, um, uh, residual waste or um, low grade values of plastics has been used uh, to feed uh, the cement kiln to replace coal. However, there are some limitations of this. Uh, although in Indonesia, the recommendations of government is to replace coal with 15% of um, uh, by, by RDF, but it's it's not easy for the cement uh, industry to achieve that target. Uh, so for car firing, also in Indonesia, <coughs> there are, uh, several power plants has been identified and um, proposed to use and applied this RDF from um, um, from palm oil uh, uh, peels and also from uh, agriculture uh, sources. Um, but also only applicable to a particular uh, type of coal fire power plants. For instance, uh, the one that had already uh, have pulverized a coal, uh, coal boiler. Um, so the stoker boiler, only some of them uh, use the, the RDF. However, the emission standard, um, due to the limitations of laboratory capacity in Indonesia, uh, the government established a very friendly and not really strict regulations um, concerning the, the the emission standards. So, for instance, for the um, cement kiln that use RDF, um, uh, they call it domestic waste or similar to domestic waste uh, as fuel. They are only obligated to um, to monitor the dioxins every four years. Although they spew all the emissions every day, um, it's very relaxed and the government said it's because uh, due to lack of uh, laboratory facility. And there is no way we can access the emission standards that released by the industry because PRTR doesn't exist yet in Indonesia. So that created another problem for, for us and, and the communities. So we're looking at the um, the regional of Southeast Asia and Australia last year um, to follow because many of the place um, plastic exported from Australia goes to Southeast Asia. So we really would like to see whether Australia already changed their regulations. Um, and uh, based on the, uh, the rules that they um, revised in 2021 due to lots of protests from uh, Southeast Asian countries, um, Australia government um, uh, revised the regulations and as of uh, the 1st of July, 2022, um, Australian um, exporters could only export the clean or uniform uh, waste. However, um, um, there are lots of, um, yeah, this is just uh, to show the examples of uh, the trade. And in Indonesia also, we look at different uh, HS codes um, to see the, the trend. But also um, we found out in, uh, for instance, this one is in Malaysia. 
that the um, TDF that imported the Malaysia is just on fire. And um, there is no strong um, emission standards or environmental monitoring standard. And uh, this kind of practice, um, well, in Malaysia, it's been uh, enforced now. Um, so the same and similar like in Indonesia, there are um, nine cement uh, kiln also in Malaysia using um, TDF and uh, RDF or PEF um, from the imported uh, waste. Um, and Thailand faced the same problem. In Thailand, they don't have regulations at all. Um, no clear regulations and definitions about RDF. Uh, it's it's make it difficult to track uh, the origin of RDF because there is no uh, enforced regulation. And then uh, the limits of dioxins um, emitted from uh, either coal fire power plants or um, Municipal waste incinerators is also not enforced or not available yet. Um, in the Philippines, RDF and PEF also <laughs> being used mainly by the cement industry and uh, relying on mainly uh, the importation of RDF. Um, although the, in the Philippines, um, the regulations said that, that um, um, it's not uh, allowed to use that, but uh, the industry um, considered RDF as the low, um, it's not a garbage, but it's a fuel. So there are different uh, interpretations in countries um, and uh, countries are struggling to um, to integrate or incorporate the new uh, type of shipments in form of uh, RDF. So I think uh, the discussions here in this webinar are also very important to uh, give inputs for, for countries, especially parties, to manage it in their own uh, countries. Uh, all the reports are available in this um, link. Um, welcome to uh, have the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yu Yun. Um, really frightening stuff all over Southeast Asia and in other parts of Asia for sure. Um, next, we're going to have uh, Ruska Trunk from Changing Markets, who's going to speak to us about a really uh, uh, problem with plastics. It's just becoming well known, and that is all of the synthetics in our textiles. So, Ruska, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, my name is Ushka. I'm a campaign manager. Okay. Oh. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, I'm a campaign manager at the Changing Markets Foundation. Uh, we are an environmental campaigning organization um, exposing irresponsible practices by companies across several sectors. And we've been working on textiles for over six years now. And we run a campaign called Fossil Fashion, which exposes the fashion industry's increasing reliance on fossil fuel based fibers, or I should say plastic fibers, uh, which make end of life management, uh, such as uh, recycling, reuse more and more challenging. So in other words, we're exposing the links between synthetics and fast fashion. And today I'm here to present our very last report and investigation called Trashion, um, with which we wanted to show what the end of the runway of fossil fashion looks like. We have done an investigation to find out what happens with used unwanted clothing that gets exported to the global south and to understand better what proportion of these gets um, recycled, reused, resold in the destination country as opposed to being landfilled or ending up um, in wider nature such as rivers and so on. Um, we have chosen Kenya as an investigation country because it, um, it receives a substantial amount of used clothing from the EU and the UK, and also because the, the national customs trade data actually allowed us to get um, more information about what is coming in. Uh, so uh, following that based research, looking at UN com trade data, national customs data, we went on the ground to actually track um, used clothing as they arrive in the country and to see what happens to them and record environmental and social impacts. And a result of that is the report, which you can 
pick up outside called Trashion, and we've also made a, a short documentary, which you can find on YouTube with the same title, Trashion. It's only 12 minutes long. I won't show it here, but I really um, yeah, invite you to have a look after because it presents well the realities on the ground. Um, what we basically found from this investigation is that the trade in used clothing is to large extent export of plastic waste. Here I want to emphasize that the, the traded, traded products that we looked at were um, worn clothing and other textiles as opposed to textile waste. So we were not looking at sorted and unsorted rags and scraps that get exported, but actually items that get exported to the Global South with a name to be there, resold, recycled, um, reused. Um, and what the traders in Kenya uh, reported to us was that 20 to 50 percent of the clothing that arrive in these bales are basically unfit to be resold and reused. That is because the exporters in the EU and the UK are packing bales with clothes that are either damaged beyond repair, they are stained, sometimes covered in vomit or soiled, uh, they are oversized or they're not fit for the climate or cultural styles, so they become waste. They also report that the, the share of clothing they receive um, every year and that it becomes waste immediately upon arrival is um, increasing every year, which links very well with the growing trend of fast fashion where we are um, yeah, putting more and more low quality items on the market every year. Um, but namely, what we found was that despite having a Basel Convention that restricts the export of plastic waste, one in three pieces of clothing arriving to Kenya was plastic-based waste, uh, meaning these were clothing items that contain synthetics such as polyester, nylon, acrylic, elastan, and were of such low quality that they were either immediately landfilled or incinerated. So um, in Kenya, in practice, that translated to 300 million items of plastic-based um, items that were immediately waste. Um, significantly contributing to the plastic pollution there. Um, and the fate of this clothing is very different. Some of them are actually being sold as fuel. For example, to the peanut roasters, you can see the mm -hmm. piles of burning clothing um, yeah, under these big pots of peanuts, mm -hmm. meaning that the locals are basically inhaling the smoke from burning synthetics uh, on a daily basis. Um, the majority of this clothing will end up on continuously grow growing landfills in Kenya. This, for example, is a Dandora dump site, which is the biggest uh, dump site in Kenya and likely in all, all Africa. It was already declared full in 2001, but it still receives around 4,000 tons of waste every day. Uh, and among these, a lot of clothing and a lot of synthetic clothing. So um, our investigation team went on the ground there and they found clothing um, running layers deep uh, and principally made of synthetic fibers. Uh, so they are dumped there and they're burned there. And uh, as you can see from the top middle picture, this dump site is surrounded by housing, by schools that are reached by this constant smoke of burning plastic uh, waste. Um, in addition to the landfills, these clothes are just kind of expanded to Nairobi River because Nairobi River kind of borders not only the dump sites but also the, the market. So in many cases, these clothes are just dumped on the ground and you have banks of the rivers that are already spongy because they're principally made of clothing. Uh, but you also have clothing that is just traveling downstream uh, the Nairobi River and reaching the sea. So as mentioned, as the lion's share of these are made of synthetic fibers, the, the microplastic leaching, the contamination of the water and the soil is likely to be significant. But unfortunately, no epidemiological study has been done so far to really you know, show the, the, the whole um, scale of the, this condition. 
Um, and yeah, just to say that this is just one country. We investigated Kenya, but there have been um, increasing reports in the past year showing that a similar image exists in Ghana, in Chile, and elsewhere. And basically, our research shows that the trade of used clothing is a very significant, but just less recognized element of plastic pollution, and that people in the global south are uh, basically left to deal with this problem. The community is there, uh, but as seen, it also has a great impact on the environment. And what is concerning is that this situation is only bound to get worse. So this is a graph we really like to show to um, show the links between the rise of synthetics, namely polyester, and fast fashion. So you have uh, the first vertical line on uh, marking the year 2000. And this is when polyester, so the one in pink overtook cotton, the one in the bottom in green, as the most used fiber. Um, and 2000s is also kind of the period that marks the start of fast fashion trend. Uh, we can see that from that point on, the production of synthetic basic experiment, it has doubled in the past 20 years. And with that, the production of clothing has doubled. So we are now in a situation where 69% of all textiles is produced from synthetics, so basically plastic-based fibers. And if this situation continues uh, in the next seven years, meaning by 2030, 73% of all textiles will be made from synthetic, so almost three quarters. Um, so this is a very concerning fact, and it also translates to consumer behavior because consumers are now buying more clothes than ever before. But wearing them less and we they buy them more because they're cheap but they're cheap because they're made of synthetics for example polyester costs half as much uh, per kilo as cotton so it just allows fashion brands to produce more of low quality items uh, but then also yeah we wear them less because they are more seen as more disposable so this as a consequence um ends up in mountains of waste much of which gets exported to the global south um recent report by the european environmental agency kind of um highlighted that this is a big problem that uh, export of used clothing tripled in the past 20 years from the eu of course and that it is bound to um, grow further um according to their estimation also 40 percent of used clothing that uh, gets shipped to Africa is essentially waste. And as it was already uh, showed by the IPN uh, report, textiles is definitely uh, an overlooked element of plastic pollution. Um, so what is the way forward? And I know Jim will talk about it more, but we are definitely um, kind of a, at a critical crossroad. At least at the EU, we have now the textile strategy that promises a set of regulation that will start regulating this sector and some of this uh, legislation will definitely hopefully if they're strong enough help uh, with these conditions by for example putting eco design criteria in place to make sure that clothes are actually designed to be sustainable and uh, looking at the possibility of having extended producer responsibilities so meaning that fashion brands and producers will actually be responsible for the waste uh, they are creating. But the, the extent of these regulations will be limited un until we have actual restrictions on the export of uh, plastic-based textiles. For example, in the, the EU already requires a separate textile collection by 2025, but we know that the, the biggest fate of separately collected textiles is export. So with this increase, we're actually, uh, the risk is that we're ending up shipping even more hazardous waste to the global south than now. Uh, and this is why it's extremely important that we have restrictions on the waste, uh, plastic-based textiles as well. And as mentioned, and I want to emphasize this over and over again, since we're looking at the future where most of our fashion and textiles in general will be plastic based, it is really crucial that this issue starts to be controlled, the export of 
plastic specs files. Um, thank you once again. I brought a lot of reports with me. Please take some so I don't have to carry them back to Brussels. They are at that table and over here. Please grab a copy. And thank you, Urshka. So we're going to get to your questions um, in a minute here. Um, first, we're going to have some thoughts about what we can do about this problem. Um, recommendations that we're putting out there immediately have to do with the fact that we have a treaty that's supposed to be doing something about this already. Um, and getting it to take that kind of action is really important. If you've been attending some of the meetings uh, and contact groups, et cetera, you know it's not always so easy to push things along. Uh, it was quite an achievement to get the Norwegian amendments. And I think we have to just dig in and say, okay, we've covered maybe half of the problem, but we still got a lot to do. So the first step is let's control the export, the back end of this industry. And that hopefully will shine a light that we give solutions lie upstream. So looking at what we can do at the Basel Convention, status quo is no Basel trade controls over these hidden and forgotten wastes. Uh, one of the things we could have happen is any party is able to make an amendment proposal. Norway did it before, and then they were joined by many other parties. So one party could, should propose to amend the convention, first of all, to include refuse derived fuel at a minimum on Annex 2, which means it's not going to necessarily be a hazardous waste, but it will be controlled by prior informed consent. Mm -hmm. And that is really winnable and doable because, we, like I mentioned, we already have on Annex 2 Y46, which is waste collected from households. So this is just a reformed waste collected from households and pelletized, still has that plastic in there. And by definition of Y48, the new plastic Annex 2 listing, it's already contaminated. It's got all this other stuff in it. It's not just plastic. So by all logic, it should be either counted as Y46 or a new entry on Annex 2. So that's one thing we need to do. Um, if it's contaminated with something that's hazardous, though, it does need to go on the other listing, which is A3210, which is the hazardous plastic. So if we have evidence that there's something really hazardous in there, like an additive, um, then we should qualify it as that. The next thing we could do is um, the technical guidelines, which I mentioned, could be revised to advise parties what to do when there's something that looks like it's a Y48, it should be controlled, but it's sitting on a listing that's in another, uh, in the non-hazardous listings, which is Annex 9. So what we could do there is say, the guidance is you don't just use the non-hazardous one, you should use the one that has the strictest control procedure. If there's an overlap and a question of which category should I use, always use the strictest one because the precautionary principle is a fundament of the convention. That's another thing we could get at a policy level. And parties that propose these amendments should propose to amend these Y48, B3011, and A3210 to explicitly add these hidden and forgotten plastics. Um, they could even put a percentage of what level of plastic they're going to allow in a bail before it becomes something that can be controlled. But this is the direction. Obviously, you don't just leave a complete gap. You have to control these things, which by all rights and all logic and all science should be controlled. And until such time as amendments and guidance are provided at Basel level, it does take some time. Uh, parties should ensure that Y48 controls are applied at national level. So you can interpret this convention as a party any way you want. It doesn't say you can't call these Y48 a bunch of textiles. They're automatically contaminated with if it's a polyester blend, for example, it's automatically contaminated with with natural fibers. So cotton and polyester automatically qualifies. And most of these loads, as you've seen the pictures, are contaminated anyway. So it's already qualifying as Y48. And any country could, could say this is Y48 in our view. Again, I said, I don't know of a country that's doing that. If I was a company authority, I would certainly do it. I would use the most strict control I could find. But I don't have that track record yet to say that this is happening. In fact, we have the opposite track record, for example, in the European Union, where they've actually advised their part member states to ignore uh, the other plastic listings and just use them as they are, which almost invariably is on the non-hazardous, uncontrolled list. So those are some things that we can do um, right away. And it's, the most impressive ones will involve getting parties to take action, 
propose amendments. So I thank you and um, we would like to hear your questions now for any of the speakers except for Juan who's gone to bed. And um, fire away, I've got some from the online participants as well. But let's start this time with, with folks in the room. Do we have any questions for anybody about any of all of this? Yes, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Griffin Chin, and I'm um, representing Center for Environment Justice. And Speak up a little bit. I'm representing SEJAD, Center for Environment Justice in Kenya. And uh, thanks for the presentation uh, from Changing Markets. This report was released uh, uh, while I was there, and it was really shocking. So I had uh, uh, thoughts and questions around, in your view, what is the low-hanging fruit uh, for, for action to address the challenge of uh, particularly the plastic textiles. Uh, you talked about exporting countries, which I mentioned some of them. Vis a vis, we are in the Basel Constitution, uh, especially on an issue that is very sensitive at national level. Politically, I mean, last during elections, this issue came about. So even when we discuss this issue of you know, used clothes, uh, at national level, it's something that would be for policymakers to take action about it in an economy or where it's very sensitive when it comes to price sensitive and all that. So I'm just wondering, would uh, in your thoughts, would low hanging fruit be from targeting maybe in the exporting countries or having, as I suggested, in the discussions around amending the Basel Convention uh, or maybe another avenue in the discussions of the plastic treaty. I just wanted to have your thoughts because for, for for us, we're also looking or the other option in my thoughts is humanizing this challenge uh, where we have health impacts, for instance. Uh, we've gone ahead uh, with the study with IPEN to look at the textile polyester uh, for PFOS, among others. That data will come out later. Uh, but how to communicate this and ensure that there is action in a very sensitive issue for, for, for us, it's, it's a very sensitive. So just your, your thoughts, uh, maybe what's yeah. the low-hanging fruit, thank you. Thank you, Griffins. I mean, you're asking a strategic question and uh, I have some ideas of what would be the smart, smartest first moves, so low-hanging fruit. The fact that the EU has actually looked at this issue at their correspondence group, and that's 27 very influential countries at this convention and around the world, they need to look at that again. And it's a, it's a working group, it's a policy level where they just need to reinterpret the convention differently. And then hopefully they'll take that reinterpretation to the Basel Convention and push it uh, as they often do um, into the global arena. So that strategically makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not saying it's a slam dunk. Uh, they may be very stubborn about keeping it, you know, a loophole. Uh, but that is something that we could do. We could even talk to the commission tomorrow here and get them starting to think about it. Uh, we could approach Norway because they, they've done half the job and all the other countries that signed up originally for the first wave of amendments. Uh, we could say, you haven't done the job, it's not done. We have to finish this and see if they have some, uh, you know, energy to do that. I know a lot of people right now are focused on the INC. Uh, the INC is not likely to really take up these plastic waste trade issues because they're going to say it's the competency of Basel. So I, I, I foresee an INC where people raise this issue, but it's going to be this is not for the INC, this is for Basel. So I almost agree, Basel has to do a job here. It's, it's, it's remit. And so let's find the strategic avenues where we can get that done. But what's very, very promising is it only takes one country to propose an amendment and to, to put it out there on the table, and then people start talking about it. The last thing I want to say, before I last see if Urshka has some ideas also, or others, is um, there is a document here at this meeting, called, it's a decision that's coming out of the meeting, what can we do else about plastics that we haven't done? So they're adding to that list, and I'm hoping that, um, so I've been in communication with some of the African delegates, that they will put this problem in for, for further study and action. So I'm hoping that's retained in the final version here, um, but that would be another way to get things moving. Do you guys have any other thoughts? No, just 
to to say we definitely agree that it was a very sensitive topic also when we engaged with the Mitumba Association and the government. I, I just want to say that one of the the problems we have identified was that the sort the sorting is failing at the source, but that's from the export country. Um, and that that is something that is in the hands of the yeah, Basel Convention and other legislation the EU is currently preparing to 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 include uh, regulation on this on better sorting and hopefully we have a waste framework directive that will do that but we don't know and this is why it's so important that Kenya as an example also then calls for amendments like this because our aim with this report and what maybe the Mitumba Association misunderstood was not to end used closing trade. We know that a lot of people rely on it and we know that our partners in Kenya are currently talking to the government, but we want uh, the government to call for these um, amendments and that the legislation follows also on the national level. So. Quick comment. Yeah, just a really quick comment on that as well. I, I think another issue is visibility and programs like we saw with Bloomberg on Haas work there. Bringing this to the attention of uh, global decision makers is really important. I don't think most of the public realise that 60 to 70 percent of our clothing is made of plastic. You know, most people would identify a plastic raincoat or whatever, but most people don't realise how much of our uh, materials. Are, and this goes to other textiles like furniture coverings and a whole range of others. That, that are actually effectively plastic. So I, I think that it's really important uh, that there's increased visibility of these issues. And this convention has another role to play. Uh, and that is that once these technical guidelines are reviewed and uh, and uh, potentially adopted, that shouldn't be the end of the story. Uh, we, we haven't answered all of these hidden plastic uh, code discussions. Uh, we haven't uh, looked at the full range of plastic pollution that's actually occurring out there every day there's new stories about what what impacts are being caused so I, I think that we have to continue the conversation with the public we have to continue the conversation with policymakers and shine a light on all the other forms of plastic pollution in society and so that we can look to regulate them and bring them under control and a way to do that is to maintain some sort of ongoing um, you know, uh, intersessional scientific expert group to continue looking into these issues through this convention uh, to look at what streams of waste that are out there, because undoubtedly there's more uh, that are contributing to the international trade, that we need, and we need to resolve that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. It's really very nice and uh, informative. And uh, with regards to the textile industry, I think textile is touching all the conventions here, the Basel, Rotterdam, and Stockholm. Stockholm Convention with persistent organic pollutants, which are sprayed for cotton, and the Basel Convention, I mean, the Rotterdam Convention, you know, some of the highly hazardous pesticides, and uh, this kills lots of farmers. And uh, because of that, there is a demand, especially in EU and uh, other countries, US, uh, a demand from the consumers to shift to organic and other brands. And there are list of uh, companies, fashion and the textile garment factories that are declaring to shift to organic. And there are lists and this is also a promotion for, for them to be ethical and to uh, get also the, ma the market access. I appreciate your approach of going to the downstream aspect to get the problem and to show the magnitude of the problem. But is there also any other approach to go upstream where these are produced and for whom? And if it's in the EU or in the US, who are these people who are really uh, buying these uh, clothes? And also to list the, 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 the companies and the textile factories which are producing this so that they can also have that competition in the market and to also bring them into the ethical approach and show them how they affect the human health and the environment, in, especially in Africa and other parts of the world. Thank you. Yes. So we emphasize synthetics because they're the biggest problem. Obviously, producing uh, any fiber at that scale is not sustainable, whether that was cotton, whether it's polyester. But here we're talking about polyester because it's really the backbone of fast fashion and because it allows such overproduction of clothing. 
Um, I agree that all fibers have negative impacts and uh, we have done, for example, investigation into the viscose production and so forth that also has challenges. Uh, but I, well, what we always are hitting against is the lack of transparency in the fashion industry. We don't know where, where things are made. We don't know where things are coming from. Also, because fashion brands do not want to disclose that. And that's kind of the starting point. And we hope that the, this upcoming legislation at the EU level uh, will play a role for the, the global industry because, for example, setting equal design criteria on how clothes need to be made will not only impact European brands, but any brand that wants to sell to the EU market. So this is where we are trying to advocate currently at the EU level, because that's kind of the only platform that is taking that step forward and, and um, yeah, push that there are really um, strong criteria for every fiber. Um, I'm happy to talk about more about that after this, uh, this um, yeah, the end of the event, because it's such a large topic, but I completely agree. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree with you today. Say, um, the answer ultimately is not going to be found in Basel. We have to be consuming less plastic and full stop. If plastic is not going to be, that's all problems aren't going to be solved by recycling our way out of it. That's become very clear. So what have we got? We've got overconsumption of plastic. The industry, the fossil fuel industry is doubling and tripling down on their outputs. For the future in the next 10 20 years they want to sell you more plastic clothing they want to sell you more single-use plastics more rdf everything they produce so we can't go to these brands and say you know you should just be doing something about your export we have to really talk to them about we're going to have to get out of a plastic fossil fuel economy uh fossil what do you call it fossil fashion is a great one but it, it applies all over the place and um we're going to have to be attacking the fossil fuel industry in terms of really changing their whole outlook. So this is why it's a very interesting struggle we have ahead of us. One of the most powerful industries on earth is up against one of the biggest problems and it includes the climate issue as well. Um, but yeah, the, the great thing about the waste trade issues is that wakes people up. This is like the most egregious symptom of a much bigger problem. And it does wake people up and that's why we hammer on it. And, we're going to continue doing that, the help of journalists, et cetera. Do you want to say anything else? Yeah. Very briefly, I, I think the detoxification of fashion is something we need to start talking about because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, maybe we need to be looking more at organic fibres. There's all these synergies involved. Uh, if we're using millions of gallons of pesticide uh, to produce, uh, you know, standard <coughs> cotton and other fibres, there's impacts from all of that. It's not just from the petrochemical-based fibres. So if we, we're talking about detoxification of plastic, we should be talking about detoxification of, of, of our uh, fashion as well and our clothing ranges. And I, I think if we're ever to move towards sustainability, that has to be a key component in the design of, of what people wear. One of the comments I've gotten from the online participants, guy, a person says, in India, they make jaggery, sugar syrup, and in Kenya, they roast peanuts with plastic waste. Hmm. Wonderful example of circular economy. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to use that as a segue because we didn't really get into the science here so much, but but Lee, um, if you could tell us what it means to be using plastic to roast peanuts, what does it mean to the actual health of uh, the emissions that people are gonna be breathing and making sugar out of it for the community nearby? Yes, well, many, many plastics that are currently in circulation contain hazardous chemicals. Some of them contain some of the most hazardous chemicals. The persistent organic and to be, to be frankly, to be cooking with plastics that contain uh, persistent organic pollutants is a horrifying concept. Uh, the contamination of the food, the contamination of the air, the residual contamination from the ash. We heard about some of that in the uh, the videos we watched. Uh, and this is this is long term persistent toxic contamination of the environment, resulting from a very short-term use of plastic to heat something to cook with. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that most people don't necessarily understand that the actual process of burning this material, especially in open fires like that, generates a whole series of other very toxic chemicals and pollutants uh, that don't just affect the people who are burning them, uh, but go on to contaminate the food chain, into the soil, into chicken eggs, into dairy products and so on. Uh, so we're creating a legacy that goes far beyond 
the, the, the actual localized pollution of, of burning the material. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a major long-term uh, hazardous problem uh, in many locations where this is, this is happening. And then you realize, even if we were miraculously going to get people not to burn the stuff, and that has never happened. I've been all over the world and people burn their waste. Um, even if we were to solve that problem, then we have this new microplastics issue. And you mentioned it along the Nairobi River, but all of this plastic products, in particular textiles, is being washed and turned into microplastics. And quickly, what is the wrong, what is wrong with microplastics? Well, you can't clean them up. It's yeah, one of they're... the major problems, but they're also a victim for these contamination uh, issues as well. Uh, they're too small to clean up by any means that we're currently aware of. It's a little bit like nanoparticles. So uh, if, if they're contaminated, they're spreading the chemicals into the environment, uh, there's no real cleanup technology available. And they're, and, and they're finding them at the top of the mountains, at the bottom of the sea, uh, in human blood, in our bodies. It's, they're, they're ubiquitous. Yes. Yes, thank you uh, the, for all the presentations that they are very, very, I find them very educative. Uh, I'm Mobash from Sierra Leone, work for the uh, Environment Protection Agency. Um, I'll sidestep from Oscar's uh, fashion a little bit. Um, one of the SDGs has to do with making energy available and, and uh, recently, in the last uh, year or so, we have been having a request for a license for people to set up a, a waste to energy plant. Uh, in Sierra Leone, we, our waste is, the plastic portion is growing, but it's still a little bit on the low side. However, for something like that, um, what are some of the pitfalls we, we, we we have to consider because we have a lack of capacity sometimes to assess all the beautiful Asia documents that uh, they, they, they made, you know, present to us. Uh, one of the first companies was actually asking to bring the waste in, but we said no, because we have a problem. We, we don't collect all the waste. So we have a lot of uh, open dump sites with waste. So we are thinking, we can get energy cheap and we can also deal with the waste problem. But from the discussions here, I'm beginning to think there must be some pitfalls um, you guys may, may want to share that we have to be careful of. Yeah. Look, waste, waste to energy by burning uh, these types of waste is a dead end solution. It, it will simply create more uh, persistent organic pollutants in the ash that's left over in the emissions from the stack. Uh, you'll be left with long-term legacies resulting from, from those issues. <laughs> if you want to provide uh, cheap energy uh, for, for, your, um, for your people in your country and you want to use waste, what, probably one of the, the best ways to do it is to use organic waste uh, through anaerobic digestion processes. And I, there were some great examples I saw of markets where there were organic, mar you know, people selling fruit and vegetable type of markets, fresh food markets, and they had a real problem because of all the organic waste left around the markets. It attracted flies, it was uh, untidy, it caused smells. They, they set up an anaerobic digester at that facility that took all of that away. They paid a small amount for this vegetable waste and so on. And it was able to create electricity that allowed them to put lighting in the market so they could operate uh, at night as well and extended the operating time of the markets and so on uh, without creating persistent organic pollutants in the environment. But the key to it was separation. You can, you can only use the organic materials uh, in, in the anaerobic digester. And at the end of the process, it also creates a digestate you can use as fertilizer. So it has many benefits without going down that pathway of burning plastic waste and other waste that are going to generate persistent organic pollutants and, and cause you further legacy problems. So it's about, there will be problems with that issue as well, but it's, it's about choosing the right set of problems to pursue. Uh, and if you go down that problem, uh, pathway of dealing with your organic waste uh, then and separating it, uh, then at least you can generate relatively clean energy, you can keep it out of landfill, you can keep it out of the groundwater uh, contamination issues. So I would be pursuing that particular pathway uh, for cheap energy as well as renewable energies and leapfrog the problems that we've had in the developed north uh, where we've committed far too much time and money and energy 
to waste to energy projects that everyone now wants to phase out because of the problems associated with them. And you will get him that case study, right? Yeah. 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 Roland. Yeah, uh, Roland Weber from International Panel on Chemical Pollution. Uh, I mean, one addition to you, I think it's quite interesting for Africa to look to this Ethiopia case where they built this huge waste incinerator. And in the beginning, it was a huge announcement, including UN. But I think it only operated for one month. Yeah, and uh, it was a 100 or 200 million plan. Yeah, which was kind of approved by Rumble, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I followed the, with the Ethiopian delegation last year and this year, so it's not operating. So I think uh, this should be more documented. Yeah. Uh, look to your investor. And I think, yeah. yes, no, normally it will not work this waste to energy uh, in, 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 in Africa. And yeah. a big part of the reason for that is the high organic content in the yeah. waste. In the waste, the yeah. separation yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. and ash management. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with the cement, yeah, that's one thing. So we had uh, from Norway also a side event. So they announced that they want to work more in Africa in respect to from uh, co-incineration of waste. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's something to to look at. Yeah, and also IPEN will look at. Yeah, but at least that's an that's an option. I mean, there is capacity to destroy it. Mm -hmm. uh, one addition maybe to the textile. Uh, I think uh, also you might push more the global textile producers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they have a kind of commitment that they want to improve recycling. I mean, I'm, I think they made it five years ago. And uh, I mean, poly polyester actually, uh, as, as uh, the, the chemical itself is recyclable. Yeah, so PET, the PET bottles are normally recycled. So, uh, and it's recycled to the polyester in the textile, but actually- it's a it's 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 a poor solution yeah, using a PET problem. bottles to produce like yeah, but no i mean what 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 need to be pushed is that they really also then follow up and recycle the polyester of the textile you know they that's so huh? and they are doing this already. yeah but but uh, no it's really it's minimal it's, it's 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 really minimal yeah i think they are they need to detoxify exactly, and then yeah. maybe they then maybe they can go more more, more circular but so but, therefore it's a bit, it, this responsibility, you know, the extended producer responsibility sure, sure. should be there. And they have made this commitment, you know, all these big brands before, but not, not much have happened. Yeah. Yeah. But the more, the more I look into this, Roland, I realize that even pet recycling is really problematic. There's, there's additives, there's the fact they have to wash all this material, massive fresh water being consumed. It's really unique. You know, uh, it down cycles every time the polyester chains get shorter, so they have to add virgin every time. So when you really look at plastics recycling, it's just not a circular material. You look at it and you go, why are we going down that pathway? When you really study everything about plastic recycling, even the, the poster child pet, which everyone says, it's great, we can recycle it. It's fraught with all kinds of problems. And uh, with respect to um, the salespeople, they're going to countries like Sierra Leone. This, this has been happening for years now with waste to energy and now it's more and more chemical recycling pyrolysis calcification there's just hundreds of these these companies are going out there trying to sell their wares to developing countries so all i can say is beware um and talk to us about the downsides because they're now well documented yes Teresa. yeah since the ethiopian case is raised uh even before before it is constructed we were informing the, the people that the moisture content of the waste produced in Ethiopia cannot be used even for energy generation. And uh, that's why it, it worked only for two weeks, just tried to work only for two weeks and it stopped. But the way I see it, it's not a solution. It's not meant for the solution of burning the locally produced waste, but it's a preparation for importing waste as a relief and others so that this yeah. material, this, this factory is already built and it should function and it should generate energy. So where does the fuel come? Yeah. It will be imported and it will be a dump site again. So this is a preparation, I think, which is going on, but it's not working in Ethiopia now, but in other African countries, maybe that's the preparation yeah. for promoting it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an old story where they sell you the machine and they say, well, economies of scale you really need more material to make it all work and so where do we get that more material from europe from usa this is an old story so beware 
Uh, this is another scheme to get rid of waste from the north to the south. So, any more questions? Time is up, even if we had some more questions. Oh, Yu Yun, do we have time for Yu Yun? It's not, a, it's not a question, Jim, but I just want to add um, from uh, my observations about RDF um, in many countries, it's important to check first is that the regulation in place, whether there is a, a sufficient safeguarding regulations in the country. The second, where's the source of RDF, whether it's domestically or from importation, how you're going to check, how you're going to um, to monitor it. And if it's importation, how you're going to, um, how do you call it, uh, check the importers, because um, to do that, they have to be registered and proof that they are going to be able to manage it. And lastly, for countries who's considering RDF, um, it's very important that there should be an off taker uh, there should be off takers of the products because rdf is not stop right there so it has to be utilized but the even the utilization in um sophisticated uh, cement kiln it's still unknown because because we cannot access we don't know public do not know uh, the emissions and releases from cement kiln from coal fire power plants and there are limitations so for countries who started thinking about, oh, probably RDF is a good good thing to, to convert the residual plastics, uh, please be careful uh, uh, thinking when you thinking about it. Um, in Indonesia uh, now, a lot of RDF, um, RDF making machines has been promoted at the small scale level. But the problem now is that there is nobody to buy the products, pellets or briquettes. And the dangerous part of it is that now the producers of RDF started offering these briquettes and pellets of RDF to use for barbecue food, you know, to use for laundry. That is ridiculous. And I think it should be highlighted also that this kind of practices is not the bad bap that accommodated in Stockholm and, and Basel Convention. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And um, if you're wondering whether to, where to get this uh, recording of this um, broadcast and presentation, start with Geneva Environment Network. But each of our organizations will also put it on our websites. And uh, yeah, we, we welcome further dialogue. So get in touch any way you can at this meeting or after. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much.